don't know why I wasn't recording. I don't really write out all the steps every single time just because it takes up space, right? Um, so we're not going to write out the whole equation all over. I'm just going to keep in mind that this is not the denominator I'm looking at anymore. It's this factored version of the denominator that I'm going to be looking at, okay? So for the LCD, remember what it is. LCD is the common factors listed once. And then the distinct factors. Distinct is just a fancy word for different. But each one that is different, okay? So I actually don't see any distinct factors in part A because X is actually in common in this fraction and in this fraction, right? And then I also see X minus two, but that's also in common with the two different fractions, okay? So I don't necessarily have any other factors in the denominators that are different from these common factors. So even though there's an X here in two of the fractions, I'm only gonna list it once in my LCD. And even though the X minus two is showing up twice for two different fractions, Again, we only write the common factor once, okay? And since there's nothing else different in the denominator outside of X and X minus two, we don't have any quote unquote distinct factors, okay? So this is my full LCD. So then what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna multiply each fraction because they all are fractions, um, even if one of them wasn't a fraction, it's still considered a quote unquote term. So I'm going to multiply each term or each fraction by this common denominator. So here I am going to have to write it out, even though I don't really want to. <laughs> and then me, if my denominators have, or any parts of my fraction have two terms, I always like to put them in parentheses. It helps later and you'll see why. So my LCD is X and then X minus two. Now I'm gonna move to the next fraction, but I have to also multiply that by X times X minus two. And then finally, I have to take this other fraction and I'm running out of space and I'm gonna use the factored version. And I also have to multiply this one by X, X minus two. So we're going to start canceling or reducing because that was the whole point, right? Of putting in the lowest common denominator so that this denominator would cancel with that factor. This denominator would cancel with this factor. And then here, both parts of the denominator cancel with the parts of the LCD. So what are we left with? We're left with three X plus two times an X plus one times an X minus two equal to just negative two since everything in the bottom went away. And then here I'm actually going to distribute this X, anytime you have one term times two terms, you have to distribute it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this becomes 3X squared plus 2X. And I'm also going to distribute this positive one. If it were a minus one, I would be distributing a negative one. So positive times a positive is positive one X. Positive one times negative two is a negative two. So could I just have a one moment just to get caught up on the- uh, Ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank you for speaking up, because I'm sure not the only one.
All right, thank you. Okay, everybody else good? I don't see anybody else looking down anymore. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So from here, I do have an X squared die, right? So I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to use my quadratic formula, but it needs to look like this, okay? Where it has to have zero on one side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this two, this negative two over. And then I think I need to actually combine my like terms at the same time. So if I want to move a negative two, I'm gonna have to do the opposite, which is add two and do the same thing on both sides. And whenever I say both sides, we mean both sides of that equal sign, right? So this will turn to nothing, right? I owe two bucks, I gave them two bucks, now there's nothing, no debt. Um, here, three X squared is the only X squared term. And here, if I combine those, that's actually a positive three X. And then coincidentally, these cancel as well, don't they? Okay, it turns out to equal zero, but I don't necessarily need to write plus zero. It's not gonna change this quantity. So I can just write it like that. If you really bothers you and you want to write plus zero, by all means, please do. It's not wrong to write it. And it actually may even help you figure out what each letter is if you do write it in there. So there are two ways to solve this problem from here. To, for me, the faster one would be to not write this zero and then just use factoring to solve this, okay? And so these both have a three and an X in common. And so three divided by three is one, X squared divided by X is another X left over. And then three X divided by itself would just be one. So that's factoring. And then you apply that zero factor property and you would set this factor equal to zero and then this factor equal to zero. Here is a linear equation. So I would divide by three to solve. And here is also another linear equation but I would have to subtract one to solve it. Zero minus one is negative one but zero divided by three is actually zero. And so I would end up with these two things as my answers, okay? So this was solving it by factoring, which is not wrong. It's totally okay to do. And if that's the way your brain went, the direction your brain went in, then perfect, this, that's good, okay? But if your brain is like, or you're not even giving it a thought, you're just like, I want to use quadratic formula because I could use it for all my quadratics, um, then you can do that. And if you do actually write in the zero, then it's a little bit easier to identify the A, the B, and the C, more specifically the C, okay? Because A is whatever's in front of X squared. And so in that case, it's a three. B is whatever is in front of X, and in this case, it happens to be a positive three. And then C is always your constant. So if that wasn't there, there's no constant, which means C would be zero. But if you wrote it down, then it's very obvious that C is zero, right? Once you identify those A, B, and C, you just stick them right into the formula and then simplify it. Usually in the calculator, some folks can do it in their head. So negative three, because my B is three, plus or minus three squared minus four times A times C, all over two times the A value. So remember the steps here, we have to do, uh, I'm trying to think of what pen to use. We have to do what's inside first, okay? And if you type all of that in your calculator, you actually get nine. I did it in my head because I know that three squared is nine and zero times anything is just gonna be zero. So I have nine minus zero 
which is why I knew it was nine without typing it in the calculator. But if you revert to the calculator, there's nothing wrong with that. And then the bottom, see here I did negative and a positive and I put a negative. And down here at the bottom, I'm gonna do two times three, which is six. Then once we have like the real number that goes inside the house, then you can actually type in the house in your calculator, as long as this number is not negative. Because if that number is negative, you have to take out the little I first, right? And then you can put this in your calculator. But the square root of nine is three, and I still have this six at the bottom. So from here, we're gonna separate it into two different fractions, okay? We're gonna have um, negative three plus three over six, and then negative three minus three over six. So we're doing each one, one with the plus in the middle, and then one with the minus in the middle. Um, you had said, I think when we were like learning about that, I, I forgot what they're called. I don't remember if it was like invisible numbers or impossible for the I numbers. Oh, you said we'd go over that more later, right? Because I still don't really like understand. Yes, we are. We have actually a whole section to go over it. They okay. just, it's not in okay. this section. Yes. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The big idea, though, for us for now is just this concept that if you have a negative number on the inside, it has to come out as an I. And then you could figure out whatever that is. Okay. But they'll do much more with those eyes in another section. Okay. Like more than just this simplification. Okay. So from here, I'm going to simplify each one of these guys. So negative three plus three is zero. And then negative three minus three is actually negative six. And zero divided by six is zero. And negative six divided by six is negative one. Now remember, it was x that equaled these numbers, right? So it's actually x that equals these numbers after all the simplifying. And they are the same numbers as we got by factoring, right? So here we did it by quadratic formula. Now, these, remember those vocabulary words, right? <laughs> so we talked about in the last class how when you do the math, you get these answers. But these answers are called proposed solutions. So we think these are the answers, OK? But it may be that one, both, or none of them are bad, OK? We don't know which ones are actual uh, solutions or which ones are extra solutions or extraneous solutions, okay? We won't know that until we try to check it. And so what you do is you plug in your number. You gotta do them one at a time, okay? So I'm gonna check this one first. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enter it in, in this spot, in this spot, in this spot, and type it in my calculator and see what number I get or whatever happens. Then if I get a number, I would go type it over here on this side and see if I get the same number, okay? The only way that this is an answer is if when I plug it in on the left side, it gives me a number. And when I plug it in on the right side, it gives me the exact same number, showing me that they're equal, right? But let's see what happens when we do the first fraction. So the first side. So three times zero um, plus two, and at the bottom, zero minus two, then plus one over zero. So I'm gonna see what I get on the left-hand side. And when I try it, it tells me error, okay? So when you get error, automatically that means that this one is not a solution, okay? This one does not, 
check. Okay. I don't even need to try it on the other side because the left side's already no good, okay? But we still need to try the other answer, which is negative one. So I'm actually going to go back and change all my zeros. Actually, I'm just going to clear the thing. So fraction three times negative one plus two. And then at the bottom, negative one plus two. And then add a whole new fraction, one over the same x value, negative one. And we'll see if it says, oh, it says negative two. So we plug this number into this side and we got negative two. Now we're gonna plug the same x into this side and hope that it's negative two, okay? If it is, then this is an answer. If I get anything else other than negative two, either a whole nother number or error, then negative one is not an answer either, okay? So let's try it in that fraction. So fraction negative two, and then parentheses, the X value I'm plugging in is negative one squared minus two parentheses negative one. So I'm plugging it in exactly what was printed, okay? Now I'm gonna hit enter. And it says negative two thirds. So is that the same thing? Did we get the same answer as before? No, right? We got negative two here, but when we plugged in the other one, we got negative two thirds. So that tells me that the left-hand side does not equal the right-hand side. So then that tells us that this one is also not a solution. And it, we didn't do anything incorrect. It just so happens that, I have a feeling this is supposed to check out. So I'm wondering if I typed in something wrong. Let's double check. Three times negative one plus two, and then negative one plus two, and then one over negative one. Yep. Negative one squared minus two times negative one. Nope, I typed them in there correctly. So this would be negative three plus two, which is negative one. Negative one, so that'd be negative three. And then, yep, nope, it does not come out. I think you put, uh, wait, I, I might have misread that, mm -hmm. but it was supposed to be x minus 2, so I'll be negative 1 minus 2. Right. For here? For that one, yeah. So I had 3 times negative 1 plus 2, and then in the bottom, negative 1, there minus it is. Two. What is it supposed to be? Um, negative one minus two. Right. So you caught it. I was like, something's not right. Because <laughs> I think that one was supposed to be correct. So let's try it again. Let's do the right function, right? So I'm plugging in negative one for x. And then I'm plugging in negative one for x at the bottom. And I plugged in negative one for x here. And let's try it now. So we can actually figure out what we're supposed to. Ah, see? negative two thirds. And when I plugged it on the right hand side, that one, let me make sure all the signs are right. Yep. And then when we hit enter on that one, we got the same negative two thirds. Good catch, good catch. But now they are equivalent, aren't they? So thank you. I had a feeling that, <laughs> that this one was supposed to work, but good. I'm glad you figured it out. So this one does check out.
And I can't tell you how many times I have to double, triple, quadruple check what I type in these calculators. And still, even then, I still oversee something sometimes. It just happens. Um, but you definitely want to try to catch that. If not, if I saw all your paper on here and then you're making a conclusion, I mean, you're going to get like almost all the freaking points. I just might be docked one point for a calculator error, right? It's not a whole like, oh, you don't know how to do this. X, all of it. No, <laughs> doesn't work like that. Or at least it shouldn't. There's some classes that do work like that, but that's not mine. Okay, so one of them did work. So then when you write your solution, if the computer says X equals and then has a box, you're only going to type in the one answer that actually worked. But if they ask you for this solution set, this verbiage, then um, what you do is you do the braces and then that one answer inside the braces. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna scoot it down a little bit so we can get to the other problem. There it is. So for this one, let me check my manual. That way it stops toggling in and out. So for this one, we're going to go about it the same way as we did the other one, but this has an X squared, which means it could probably be factored, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect square, and one is actually the same thing as one squared. Okay, so it is a difference of two squares, and we have a formula on how to factor that. It would be whatever's being squared in the front, whatever's being squared in the back, and then one with a plus and one with a minus, right? That's the difference of squares factor formula. Now, instead of looking at this original denominator, I'm going to look at the factored version of the denominator to be able to figure out what the LCD is. And so the LCD here is actually, if I cover that up just so my eyes don't look at it, um, So I'm looking at this denominator, this denominator, and the factored version of the other denominator, okay? They don't have any quote unquote distinct factors. They only have common factors because this X minus one is in common over here. And this X plus one is in common over here as well. So they don't have anything else outside of that X plus one and the X minus one in the denominator. So I'm only gonna have common factors here. The first one being X minus one, and then the other one being X plus one. If you put these in the reverse order, it does not make a difference, okay? Just as long as you have them both there. So then this is the annoying part where I have to rewrite the whole thing. But it's easier if you do, just so that it's not all messy. I'm going to change up my color, and I'm going to put green. So my LCD, see, notice I had it there, but then I changed them, right? It doesn't matter, as long as they're both there. And again, I'm not going to use the original denominator. I'm going to use the factored version of the denominator over here. And then we'll multiply by this LCD as well. I couldn't scoot it in there. So imagine that the other one is next to it. <laughs> I just didn't have any more, any more room there.
Okay, so let's go ahead and strike these out. So this one here will actually cancel out with that x minus one. This x plus one will actually strike out with that x plus one. And then here, both of them actually go away. So x plus one goes away and the x minus one goes away. So what I'm left with is this negative 4x and then times this x plus 1. Over here, I'm left with plus 4 times the x minus 1. And then after the equal sign, since all these went away, I only have the negative 8. Now, it doesn't look like a quadratic yet, but I have all my multiplying yet, right? Like we got rid of all the fractions, but now we have those parentheses, which means we have to do our um, distributing. So we're going to take this negative 4x and distribute it here. And then we're going to take this positive 4 and distribute it here. So we'll end up with negative 4x squared. And then this times 1 will be negative 4x. And then positive 4 times positive x is positive 4x. And then positive 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Now I do see a squared function. So we do, we could use the quadratic formula. There is another way to do it that's shorter. So I'm gonna do it one way first and then I'll go back and revisit it and do it the quadratic formula way, okay? Mm -hmm. One thing I know is that for quadratics, you do have to have zero over here. So to get that zero, I'm actually gonna add eight on both sides. And so that should give me the zero. Over here though, this is the only x squared term. So it just comes down. And here, if I combine these two, you actually get zero x's, right? Negative four x plus four x means the four x's are gonna cancel. Um, and then over here, negative four plus eight is actually positive four. Now you don't have to write it, but if you wanted, you could write plus zero X. So one of the ways that I could solve this is called extracting roots. I think they also talked about um, applying the square root property. So these are just the words that they used when they were giving us this method, okay? So if I'm going to do it by extracting roots, I will not be writing in zero X. If there's no X's, then I don't need to write the X's, okay? But when you're doing extracting roots, you do have to get the X squared guy completely by itself. So I do have to move over this four first by doing the opposite of addition, which is subtraction. And then zero take away four is negative four. And then I have to get rid of this coefficient by dividing by it. And so I have X squared equal to anything divided by its exact self will just be one. Now the square root property says that if you take the square root on both sides, you automatically get plus or minus. And we know that when you square root a square, 
they just basically cancel each other and you have x. But what is the square root of one? If you don't know it, you could type it in here, right? Square root of one, and it's just one without the house. So you actually get two answers. You get positive one and negative one. And I could only do it this way because there was no X term in the middle, okay? But if you do have it like this, then you should be able to use the quadratic formula. Your A is the number in front of X squared, which is negative four. Your B is the number in front of X, which is zero here. Or if you had chosen not to write zero X, just because they cancel each other, these guys cancel each other. If this was missing, the fact that X is missing means that the coefficient in front of it is zero. Similarly, if you hadn't written this, the constant, if it's missing, is automatically going to be zero. And then finally, my constant, which in this case is a positive four. And so we go through our little quadratic formula. So we have x equals negative b plus or minus b squared minus four times a times c all over two times a. Now zero is neutral. It's neither positive nor negative, okay? So if you have a negative sign times zero, it's still just zero. There's no such thing as negative zero because zero does not have a sign, okay? So it's still just zero here in the front. But if you type all of this inside the calculator, you should end up with 64. And it should be positive. If you type all of that in there exactly the way it is, you should, the calculator should tell you positive 64. Maybe I did it wrong, but when I typed it into the calculator, I got uh, eight. Did you type in the house as well? Yes. Just type in the inside. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't ever put the house in automatically just because sometimes it's negative and then all the calculator tells me is error. And I just spent all that time typing it in there. <laughs> so I always just do the inside first and then only if it's positive do I do the actual radical part. But it will be eight eventually, that's not wrong. So in the bottom, when I multiply the bottom, I actually get negative eight. But then the next step, I don't even need to write this. If I'm taking zero plus or minus this number, aren't I just gonna get plus or minus that number, right? Because I'm not adding or subtracting anything. So I don't have to write that zero. But when I do this whole thing now in the calculator, the square root of 64, it does tell me that it's eight without a house. And so if you typed in the whole thing, yeah, it'll stick out, pop out that eight, the same. The only time typing in the whole house will give you the answer is if it happened to have been an imaginary. Then all your calculator is gonna say is error, and then you have to do it in pieces. but we'll probably see more like that. So here I do have two problems in one, although it doesn't look quite like that, like it has been looking. 
Um, but this is two problems. It's x equal to positive 8 over negative 8, and then x equal to negative 8 over negative 8. And so this numbers gives me one, but a positive divided by a negative is negative one. And these numbers, eight divided by eight is one, but a negative divided by a negative is positive one. And you could type those fractions in your calculator, right, to verify that they're negative one and positive one. But we do get the same answers. They might be in a different order, but they're still the same numbers, right? So in order for us to know whether or not one or negative one is an actual solution, we do have to plug them into the original equation. So I'm actually gonna start by plugging in positive one, okay? So if I go to my equation up here, clear that out, I'm gonna type in my first fraction, negative four times, actually I wanna plug in negative one and I'm gonna explain why. If I plug in one and then I go to try to edit it later with a negative one, notice that it typed over my parentheses, right? And it's gonna screw everything up when I try to enter it in there. However, if I were to plug in negative one first, I could go back over here and then just delete that and it doesn't mess everything up, okay? So if you do have some situation like that where you have two numbers to check, I would check the negative number first and then that way all you have to do is delete the negatives and then you can type in the other one number, okay? So negative one, and then at the bottom is gonna be negative one minus one. And then the second fraction is four on top. Oops, I pressed the wrong button, delete, delete. There we go, plus, and then fraction, four on top, and negative one plus one. So when I hit enter, it gives me error. So I plugged it in here and it gave me error. It doesn't even matter what happens when I plug it in on the other side. If you get error, it's automatically no good. So the negative one was the one that I typed in first. So this one is just no good. or you can just say error, right? Same thing. That's why it doesn't work, because it gave you an error, okay? Now, when I try to type in the positive one, all I have to do is change all of those negative ones I plugged in to positive one. So negative four times delete a positive one, delete positive one minus one, and then four over positive one plus one. And it just tells me the same thing, error, okay? So this one gave us an error as well. So we had two proposed solutions, right? Like we did all the math, everything is correct. We didn't do anything messed up. Um, we didn't make any errors or anything like that, but these two numbers did not work. So basically what happens is, is I don't have an answer. There's no solution, okay? And so that's all you say is no solution. We tried, we did a lot of work, but the two numbers we got were bad. And if it happens to ask you for solution set, this one's really weird. Um, because there's no actual answers, you really type in what's called an empty set where there's literally nothing inside the braces because there's no answers. Does anybody have any questions over that one? We will probably have some more quadratics to solve today. Um, but we are gonna be shifting over 
to a different kind of equation. So remember at the beginning of this section, there were rational equations, and then there were radical equations, and then there were rational exponent equations, okay? So we haven't gotten to the other two kinds. We're now gonna finally get into the rational, radical equations. So rational is fraction. Radical is the little houses. Right, just to recap that. Rational, it's a ratio, which means fraction. And then radical is um, like the roots or house, but it's these guys. You have some kind of index, but then a house, okay? So the cool thing about radicals is that you can get rid of the radicals because of this power property, okay? The power property tells you that if you have an equation and the left side equals the right side, then when you apply a power to both sides of that equal sign, you still get an equivalent um, expressions on each side, okay? That's like saying this is four and this is four. So when I square both sides, if both sides were four, then both sides are gonna be 16 after I apply a square, right? That's all it's saying, okay? However, not always are the solutions for this equation the exact same as the solutions for this equation. Once you apply those powers, you could actually end up with extra solutions, okay? And so that's why in this section, it's super important to also check your proposed solutions, okay? So if you have rational or radical equations, you must check your answers. You cannot, you're really taking a, a, a big risk <laughs> as to whether or not the problem will be correct if you just do the math and then type in the numbers that you found, okay? Because sometimes they, they are answers and sometimes they're not, right? And the directions will never say, find the proposed solutions. I mean, that's part of the process to find the actual solutions, but they'll never ask you, what are the proposed solutions? They'll just ask you, what are the solutions, okay? So not only do you have to find those proposed solutions, but then you have to check them to see which ones are actual solutions. Um, and I think that's what this was saying too, something about how that it does not say that this equation and that equation are the same equation. It is changing it. And therefore it does change the solutions, okay? However, what it does tell us, this, this property, is that any solution to this equation would also be a solution to this one. It's just that the one with the powers might have some extras, okay? So these are the four steps to solving a radical. And this one gets a little bit weird, but we'll talk about it when you have to repeat, okay? If you only have one radical in the whole equation, you won't have to repeat because there's only one radical. If you have two radicals in the equation, sometimes it repeats and sometimes it doesn't, okay? And in this class, I don't think we ever have to do the repeating part. They just don't give us those kinds, okay? So we won't usually ever have to do this part. They keep them pretty simple for us in this class, mostly because you guys are not gonna be doing things that complex. I mean, shoot, you're probably not even gonna be doing anything this complex <laughs> in your daily job once you do it, right? Um, and I always get that question, like, why do I gotta do all this stuff? And if I'm not gonna be doing any of this stuff when I get to my actual field, and there is an answer to that question. Um, basically, some scientist somewhere figured out that in order for you to get to be capable of really top tier critical thinking skills, 
you should be able to do a certain level of algebra, okay? And that's the only reason why we're doing it is because if we exercise our brains enough to comprehend this algebra, then that part of our brain is strong enough to critically think. That's essentially all it boils down to, okay? I know it can be annoying a little bit, <laughs> but we're working together and we'll get through it. Okay, so we're gonna follow these steps. So step one says to isolate the radical on one side of the equation. So essentially what you want is the radical all by itself and everything else that doesn't have a house on the other side, okay? Now, sometimes there's more easier ways to do things though. You have choices, right? It doesn't tell you which side this radical needs to be on. It just tells you it needs to be on one side, okay? So it might not always be easier or better to have the radical on the left-hand side. This is a perfect case of that situation because if I were to move this X over, I would have to minus X on both sides, right? But if I did that, it would only get rid of the X. It wouldn't get rid of this negative symbol. And then zero take away X is just gonna be a negative X whatever x is, it'll be a negative of that. But we haven't quite isolated this radical yet because it still has a little negative in the front, okay? Now you do have to remember if you, do, if you did do this, um, that there's always a little negative one coefficient, always. Whether it's on the x's or it's on the radicals, it's always a negative one coefficient. So I could divide both sides by negative one, and then I would have the house all by itself, and a negative and a negative is just a positive. And anything over one is just the whole number, right? That was a lot of steps, okay? It was like, what, one, two, two steps and a couple of rewriting parts? The better way to do it would have been and the faster way would have been to instead of moving the X over, to move the whole house over. Because in order to do that, I would have to add the house because it's subtracting the house, right? And then upon doing that, I would have X all by itself over here and zero plus anything is just gonna be that same thing and I would have the house over here. But notice this time I only had to do one step, right? Instead of two. So regardless of which way you go, you can still get to the same, same place, okay? Before you continue. But you do have to have that house completely by itself on one side, okay? It doesn't matter which side, it just has to be by itself. Once you have, it doesn't matter which one you have, okay? It's like if I had a balance beam and I'm standing, um, I guess in your perspective, you're in front of the balance beam and I'm behind it versus if we swapped places, the balance beam is still balanced. It doesn't matter what side of the balance beam you stand on, okay? So it could be written either way. Um, I'm just going to use this one because it's like scooted close to each other and this one's kind of spaced out, okay? But we did do step one. Step one was to isolate the radical. Step one is now done, okay? Then step two says, raise each side of the equation to a power that is the same as the index of the radical so that the radical is eliminated, right? We already know from our properties of exponents that if the power and the index are the same, they basically undo each other, okay? But here's the question. What is the index of this radical? What kind of house is it? Or what kind of root is it? 
would be squared, so would that be two? Mm -hmm. It is a square root, so it is a two. So if that's my index, step two says that that's the exponent I have to apply to both sides. And then we already know that if the house index and the exponent are the same, they kick each other out. And so then you just end up with whatever's inside of that radical all by itself with no more house. But on the right-hand side, I have X being squared. So that is gonna end up with X squared. And because it's a square, right, it's a quadratic. So remember with quadratics, you wanna get them equal to zero before you start trying to do your quadratic formula or your factory or anything like that. But in order for me to get it equal to zero, again, we have two choices. I could move the X squared over to that side and I'd have all my terms on one side. But I mentioned to you guys in the last class that I don't ever do that. If x squared is positive already, I'm going to leave him alone and actually move the other two people over there. Okay. So I'm actually going to minus 15 and add 2x. And I'll do the same thing over here, but I'm actually going to do them in another order. So I'm going to put the plus 2x first and then the minus 15. But I am doing the same thing on both sides of this equation. I put them in order like that for a reason though, right? Because that's the order in which they have to look for me to figure out what A, B, and C are. And here, since that will wipe out and this will wipe out, I will have zero on that side. So this was step two. And I'm actually doing step three. It's just gonna take me a little bit because I need to solve the resulting equation and I'm working my way to get there, okay? Now, two ways to do this is to either factor it or to do the quadratic formula. Now that we have that quadratic formula, I'm just gonna use the quadratic formula, okay? So here my A is an invisible one. My B is a positive two, and then my C is a negative 15. So let's see what that's gonna look like. X equals negative B plus or minus B again squared minus four times A, which is one, times C, which is negative 15, all over two times A. So a negative and a positive is ultimately gonna be a negative up there. And then two times one is a two. I just wanna figure out what's gonna go in the house. Okay, so I'm only doing the inside. And I believe if you do that, you should be getting 64. So it is a positive 64. So I don't have to do anything with eyes or anything like that. We can just go ahead and figure out what the square root of 64 is. And that one we did already see earlier. I'm actually gonna scribble over here because I'm running out of space. Um, but the square root of 64 is eight. Um, and since there's no more house or anything like that, I'm just gonna separate the two problems. So negative two plus eight over two negative two minus eight over two. 
And then that is six. This one is negative 10. And when I divide those by two, I end up with three and negative five. So these are my proposed solutions. So I finally finished step three. And then step four just says to make sure that you check your proposed solution or solutions, right, with an S, in the original equation. So you don't want to check it at any of your steps that you've made. You always want to check in your original, okay? So first, I'm going to check three. And we got lucky because all we have on the right-hand side is a zero. So all I have to do is plug in my number on the left and then see if it equals zero. Okay, so let's do the first one. Three minus second, and then this button here to get the house. The house is up above it. Um, and then in the house, we are typing 15 minus two, and then I'm plugging in three. And I should have done my negative number first, but it's okay. <laughs> so I did get zero. So this one does check out, okay? Now we'll go check negative five. And I am probably gonna have to type it in again because I can't put a negative in there. So negative five minus the square root, 15 minus two parentheses, negative five. And hope it gives me zero. Oh, nope, it gave me negative 10. Now that's not the same as zero. So then in this case, this one did not check out. So my only answer is going to be three. Or if they ask you for a solution set, right, it's just three inside the braces. Now, the next one we're going to go over, we'll go over one more. That's it. I think the next one is actually um, a pretty interesting one. So we'll cover it, and then that'll be the only thing we do today. So we definitely will not be finishing this section today because we still I have two more radical ones, and then we still have to talk about these rational exponents, okay? So if I have to shift deadlines on assignments, I'll do that. Um, I'll figure out where we are and what's going on, make some changes, and then I'll always send out a remind message and let you know what all is changing, okay? That way you know if you have more time to work on this assignment and how long you have to work on this assignment. Because I don't want to make it due today because we haven't finished it, right? Or not today, but tomorrow. So we're going to work on this one. I didn't want to do one with two radicals because as I mentioned, they don't cover that in this class, but I did see a weird one like this in the homework, okay? So I wanted to try to go over one similar. So remember the step one was to isolate the radical. So you wanna get the house all by itself. So in this case, I just have to move over that eight. So I would add eight to both sides. That would only keep me with just the house, the eight would be gone and it would actually be two X and then plus four. Now that step one is done, I can apply my index as a power on both sides. Now this index again is nothing there. So it's automatically a square root. So I'm gonna apply my square on both sides. Notice that I, I put in my parentheses around everything on the left side and around everything on the right side. Now here, the house and the power will basically cancel each other out and we just end up with the 9x plus 27. But over here, we have to remember what a square means. A square means that it's this thing times itself and only two factors of it. 
right? If it were a cube, I would have three factors of it. So I am going to have to do my foiling situation over here, right? So I'm gonna do two X times the second parentheses and then my plus four. So this guy times all of that. And then the next guy times all of that. Or you can foil if that's how you learned how to do it. Whatever you need to do to get those, um, all the terms. So now I'm gonna distribute this one and I'm gonna distribute this one. So this gives me 4x squared. 2x times 4 gives me 8x. 4 times 2x, also 8x. And then 4 times 4 is 16. So I do have a square. And it's positive over here. So it is a quadratic. And I want all of my terms over there so that I can do my quadratic formula. So I'm going to minus the 9x and the 27. I'm going to put my minus 9x here and my minus 27 over there with the like terms. So let's see, we have 8. Oops, eight plus eight minus nine means I'm gonna have a total of positive seven X's. And then positive 16 take away 27 means I'm gonna have a negative 11. So I'm just combining these like terms and then combining these like terms. And I don't think we're going to have enough time. I'm just going to identify A, B, and C here, and then I'll stop. And when we come back the next time, we'll go through the rest of it, okay? If you want to go through the rest of it on your own to see if you can figure it out, that's totally okay. But I'm just going to stop after A, B, and C. So A is the number in front of X squared. B is the number in front of X, which is positive 7. And then C is the constant, which happens to be a negative 11, okay? And then from there, you would plug everybody into this guy, right? The quadratic formula, and then see what your two answers are. And then always make sure you check it on this side, see what you get, and then check it on that side, and hopefully you get the same thing, okay? But for right now, we're gonna stop and like I said, I'm going to send out a remind message to let you know when, what the date is when I push this back and how that's going to affect the other sections, okay? Does anybody have any other questions? If not, I hope you guys have a great weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.